Jim. Guys, how's it going? GM. Look at this. Good. How are you? Great. I love I love, I love this like this new stream setup. We have. everything feels so official. You know, it's, it's uh, I don't know. It's very well put together. Shout out to Sam. <laughs> good. We're legit now. <laughs> very, yeah, yeah, we're legit now. Uh, that's a good way to put it. Um, uh, very excited to be here today. Wow. Like, you know, I think the past 48 hours has been very, very fun. Uh, I think not only for us here at Off-Chain Lab, but also everyone in the, uh, the community. Uh, you know, the users, the DGens, the projects. I think everyone's been pretty excited. I mean, it's, you know, it's it's only like a casual, like, couple years of work all coming together towards something that's making, you know, using using Ethereum and Arbitrum actually massively cheaper. I mean, who cares? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's not the end of the journey either, right? Is we, we have a long way to go to make this even better, even more scalable than it is, right? 100%, yes. Oh, man, and that, that constant blockchain grind of, like, Okay, that that's over now. What's the next thing? Where 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 where, where are we going next? That's all you know. Den Coon blobs. That's old news. Yeah. I, I yeah. used to think there was a point where we, we'd actually like relax a little bit, but there is no yeah, there is no plan. No, that's right. We need that. We need to add in <laughs> zero as soon as possible. Yes, the meme embracing the meme. <laughs> okay, so but before we get into it, then um, for people who don't know, um, I'm Hunter. I do community strategy here at Optin Labs. I'm joined today by Harry, uh, co-founder and uh, CTO at Offchain Labs as well. And of course, Ed Felton, who's also a co-founder and chief scientist uh, here at OCL. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's like, we have a ton of stuff to talk about, obviously. You already mentioned a couple things, Ed. Um, maybe we can start off just with like, maybe like an Eli 5 on uh, Denkin and maybe uh, how ArbOS V20 Atlas kind of, uh, kind of mixes there or, you know, matches there. Maybe I'll talk about Denkun and Harry can talk about Atlas. Perfect. Sounds great. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yeah. So Denkun is the latest Ethereum hard fork or upgrade that has been live for about two days now. Um, and um, it brings a bunch of improvements to Ethereum, things around how, um, say, Ethereum validators can stake and unstake and some some, some useful technical improvements. But the big thing that Denkun uh, brings, brought, is um, EIP 4844 or data blobs. And so what this is basically is it's a different way that Ethereum can uh, store and provide availability for data that is lower cost. And it's lower cost because it does less, but it does enough to support roll-up chains like, uh, like Arbitrum and, and really all the L2s. So new way of having data that's much lower cost. And that translates into a big opportunity for rollups like the Arbitrum Tech rollups. And that brings us to Atlas. Yeah. So Arbitrum Atlas with, with Denkun blobs are available, but there's nothing kind of, it's a whole new API. It's a whole new thing that is kind of, hey, there's this blob, there's a new transaction type, there's all this new stuff. Rollups get nothing out of the box. And, and kind of, as you may have seen, some rollups already are using blobs, other rollups aren't using blobs. Arbitrum uh, one started using blobs around a day after um, they started existing on Ethereum. Um, and that's because this is a significant architectural difference. Um, and so, Work had to be done in order to both sort of have the batch have the the batch poster, which actually is responsible for taking user transactions and putting them onto Ethereum to actually understand this new type. Um, the actual smart contracts had to be modified in order to actually be able to receive the blobs and be able to make use of them and kind of do perform the same duties as they do with call data, except on this new data type. Um, it also required a lot of advanced planning. Um, and if you look, the Arbitrum DAO. A month ago or more than a month ago was, was talking about this and talking about ArbOS Atlas because this is not a thing that kind of anybody could just do. This is a thing that's kind of a comprehensive change to the the whole system in, in a fairly deep way, um, rewritten on top of in order to be able to use this whole new data type. Got you. And, and I think uh, you kind of mentioned it there, uh, Harry, but like uh, so in this case, obviously Ethereum upgraded to kind of support blobs, um, but also every L2 individually had to do the same. Uh, is it is there kind of like, I don't know. I mean, so at this point, is every L2 supporting blobs right now, like technically, or, or are there some, I guess, I don't that think aren't? all of them. Yeah, yeah. Not all of them. Most, most okay. of the major ones are. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. 
but some some the rest we assume will you know bring blob capability online over the coming days or weeks it's the the complex the roughly speaking i think a lot of the complexity here comes from kind of call data was relatively simple and that you get the data in your smart contract and you can do whatever with it you can hash it you can kind of store it you can do you can do anything you want blob data you instead introduce a bunch of new cryptography using using kind of the kzg commitments is the kind of the the way that those show up on ethereum and actually sort of integrating those into um into fraud proving systems or into validity proving systems um tends to bring along kind of a, a a good bit of complexity it's very doable but it's also kind of very non-trivial the the work necessary in order to do that and i think that kind of getting getting those components integrated it's not as simple as just basically you're posting blobs there it's that when those blobs get posted your whole your whole sort of roll up validity fraud what have you system has to account for it and, and be able to handle it yeah, so the you know the the uh, the engineering team at Offchain Labs started working on this integration last year, um, and then it was tested on the Sepolia testnet before it went before uh, Ethereum was ready with uh, their Denkun upgrade. So um, yeah, when when Ethereum brought this data blob functionality in um, two days ago, um, one day later. The Arbitrum Atlas upgrade was um, was deployed, and uh, and Arbitrum one started posting these data blobs, and you saw a big reduction in transaction cost at that time. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I remember like when I was, I was tracking it yesterday too, and I'm like, I think at first swaps were like a dollar thirty. I tried it again after blobs went live, like literally right after blobs went live, it was forty cents. I'm like, okay, it's a little little cheaper. I tried it again after five ten minutes, it was like four cents. But okay, that's a lot cheaper. <laughs> Yeah, it was very, it was very, very surprising. Uh, <laughs> I, I think before we do dive into EIP forty four in particular, um, there were different EIP. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, EIPs in Atlas. Is it worth just like broad kind of brush, just mentioning those real quick? Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see. Now I'm, I'm, I'm going off the top of my head. So you're, you're, you're testing me. My, yeah, uh, to test a little bit. <laughs> there's a number of, and, and these are kind of all things that were picked up from. Um, from Ethereum and that kind of when when sort of Arbitrum adopts an upgrade, it's interesting with 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 Denkun in general, there's really sort of two things that happened. One is that sort of Ethereum started support started started supporting these blobs and Arbitrum wanted to make use of it. But there's also for any Ethereum hard fork, this notion of kind of well, Ethereum's making changes to how the EVM works, um, then maybe kind of Arbitrum would want to actually pick up similar changes. Um, and this is caused this is this doesn't happen automatically and, and in fact it actually kind of caused i would say a, a decent amount of kind of pain in the arbitrum ecosystem not from this consensus upgrade but from the previous consensus upgrade um which added a new opcode called push zero um which was incorporated in arbo s11 which happened i'm not sure how many but a number of months after um it had been deployed on ethereum um, and developers kind of had certain EVM code would work on Ethereum, wouldn't work on Arbitrum, not very fun. Um, with Denkun, Arbitrum as a, as a, kind of as part of Arbo S20 was updated to include all of the core kind of all of the core relevant changes um, from the Ethereum upgrade into Arbitrum. Um, and kind of from that, you have uh, you have transient storage, which is kind of this big, this big, uh, and you and you also have um, kind of changes to how self destruct works, um, and you also have an interesting kind of low level technical detail about sort of copying memory, which is probably I would say the least exciting of the of those three. Um, transient storage, um, you've probably heard um, a bunch about this from Uniswap v4, um, which kind of has was built using transient storage, and, and the Uniswap team did a lot to kind of um, push for people to get excited. Um, it, it sort of, I, I'm not going to go into kind of the lower level details of exactly what it does, but it essentially provides a, a version of store. You have memory that's kind of just in your smart contract and just in sort of like a particular kind of call to your smart contract. So it disappears the second you leave it. You have storage, which is permanent, and then you have transient storage, which is somewhere in between and kind of lasts for a transaction. Um, and then so the self-destruct one is interesting um, in that one of the one of the big it's this isn't even why it's why it was done it, it, it was done as, as preparation for vertical trees 
Um, and because self-destructs will actually remove account entire accounts from the state and doing that after vertical trees complicated. Um, I, I am not an expert here, but, but kind of very messy. It has a nice side effect though, which is that one of the biggest types of vulnerabilities that's affected Ethereum smart contracts um, is based on this pattern of your smart contract is using a, pro a transparent upgradable proxy um, because you want to be able to upgrade the logic. And your logic contract, which is kind of the actual backing code for it, contains a call to self-destruct. Um, and it's not permissioned and anybody can call it. Um, and so they can basically completely brick your smart contract um, if they can find a way to call self-destruct in the logic contract. And there have been, I think the, the highest the highest profile version of this that occurred was a, a number of years ago. Um, there was a huge amount of ETH that's locked and is still locked to this day um, from a smart contract wallet um, that, that Gnosis had that uh, that had this issue um, and someone came along and triggered it and the money was trapped forever so the fact that that cannot can no longer happen again uh, is pretty is pretty nice yeah <laughs> yeah so that's like that's like a good that's sort of a good housekeeping um improvement um in in ethereum that it makes ethereum safer um and by making it safer like harry said it makes uh it helps to lay groundwork for future changes to ethereum in particular, the vertical trees, which are um, a an improved way of managing the state of Ethereum, which we think is coming, um, which is coming at some point in the future. So, you know, th this is the next step in a longer roadmap for 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 Ethereum. Just like Atlas is like the the next step in the further development of Arbitrum. Interesting. I, I, and I, I think I got like all that makes as much sense as it can to someone who doesn't, you know, do any like core development work. Uh, which, <laughs> so like for what it's worth, I remember when I was doing research on this beforehand, the conclusion I came to, and I, uh, I, I feel like it was it was coming through in what you guys and how you guys were explaining this, is we're essentially making we're essentially giving a lot more capacity to L2s today mm -hmm. through blobs and APO44 in particular, but we're also kind of setting it up so that uh, the structure of transactions and whatnot are. are essentially going to be ready for the future of Ethereum when like sharding or something kind of comes into play. Yeah, exactly. So one of the clever things that the uh, Ethereum uh, community did in how they designed this EIP 4844 data blob mechanism is that there's a lot of room for growth that the code in a rollup that can handle these data blobs, um, that there will be future generations of the data blob mechanism in Ethereum, which will be more and more capable. They'll be able to handle more data and handle it um, and handle it reliably and with lower cost. Um, and the beauty of the of the way of the design change that happened now is the rollups won't have to change their code at all to to use these improvements because this is because the the API that is the way that rollups talk to Ethereum uh, to use these data blobs is already set up. To, to handle the future roadmap of Ethereum. Uh, and so that's pretty great. What it means that is as Ethereum upgrades into better and better versions of the blob technology, that rollups will just automatically take advantage of that. That's awesome. It's, it's actually such like a, I, I don't know, for some reason, like, uh, and I, I, I kind of learned this, like I think like two days ago before the taxi went live. It's just so cool. It's just like one of the little things that, I don't want to say was snuck in there, but just wasn't included in like, the grandiose marketing and like from people on CT, yeah. uh, that just is yeah. this really cool little fact there. Like we're really literally future proofing ourselves for the future of Ethereum. Well, that's like to me, this is like an, just an illustration of why the really big and robust and diverse Ethereum technical community is so valuable. Yeah, right. Because you have so many eyes on these proposals and so much public discussion of what they are and how they can work. Um, and that you really get that distillation of the best ideas across the whole community. It's, I mean, it's true in Ethereum. It's true in the Arbitrum community as well. You just have a lot of brains that are thinking about and talking about this. Uh, you know, what can happen and what is the, not just what is the amazing thing we're going to do, but what is the best way to do that amazing thing so that it's going to have legs into the future? No, definitely. Um, yeah, no, 100%. Uh, and, and, and I think with that, we can jump into a little bit of the EIP 4044 stuff, since there's like a lot of 
I, I think on the surface, like kind of like the explanation of blob data uh, makes sense to me. Um, but I think there's like a lot of like nuances there that are really important. Um, <clears throat> I think one of which is that you can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I kind of I feel like I've been kind of viewing this as more of like it's essentially a global market that's on Ethereum that every L2 is more or less kind of competing for space on. So yeah. like if, essentially, so I guess the question here is, do other L2s essentially affect pricing for blob data, for for example, arbitrage? Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah, let me talk about how the pricing works. Um, and there's a lot of nuance in it, but at a basic level, it's pretty simple. That um, Ethereum has a target of using three blobs per Ethereum block. So that's one block every four seconds on average. One blob, excuse me, one data blob. A data blob is about 128 kilobytes of data. It's just a fixed size chunk of data. Um, and Ethereum has this target of about one blob every four seconds. And so Ethereum keeps track of how many blobs are used. And if the usage is above the target, then the price of blobs will go up. Ethereum will automatically adjust the price of blobs so that if usage is above the target, the price goes up. If usage is below the target, the price goes down. And so if you think about this, basically, if there's a lot of use that will cause the price to go up and the price will go up and keep going up until the users kind of back off a little bit, right? Because, because the price is high. So the price goes up, then people will slow down and then the price will kind of come to an equilibrium to like a middle level where the price is high enough that people are not overusing it, um, but, um, but also low enough that people are really using it at the target. So right now, in, we're in very early days. And in fact, the price is almost zero. The price is at the minimum because the rollups use is not quite up to that three blobs per block, per Ethereum block, one blob per four seconds target. But if usage of blobs continues to grow, then you get to the point where the blob price will go up and it'll sort of stabilize at some middle level. But it really is, it's kind of supply and demand. Right? There's a fixed supply of blobs, one every four seconds, and the price will go up as needed to uh, make sure that um, blobs aren't overused. So you can think of that as a kind of anti-spam mechanism. That's one way of thinking about it, right? If people start spamming um, Ethereum with, with blobs, the price will go up, and it will go up enough that to, to, to scare off the spammers. Um, but you can also imagine a scenario where rollups want to use an awful lot of blobs, and so the blob price goes up higher. Um, so you know we're kind of living in the super happy time right now because blob prices are absolutely on the floor. They're min they're they're minimum, literally one way that is um, one bi a billionth of a billionth of an ETH um, for each byte of data in a blob. Um, so that's incredibly cheap. Um, it might not be that way forever, but it, it will be cheaper than data has been. And as Ethereum grows its blob capacity, right, then that target will no longer be one blob per four seconds. It might be one blob per second or one blob per 64th of a second. Uh, we can kind of see what's going to happen, that Ethereum will grow its capacity. And every time they grow capacity, prices will come down and, and rollups will be able to do more. You can definitely you can you can look at this and think about this very similarly to how kind of regular gas has worked on Ethereum um, in that you have kind of a very similar situation where you have this pricing adjustment. You have the 15 million gas per 12 second target. It can go above there up to 30. If that happens, the price rises. It can go below there. The price falls and periodically um we miners have have or well miners wow okay that's that's old validators um <laughs> have uh, have voted to have voted to increase um the amount of gas that the network can actually handle um in order to uh in order to allow for more <laughs> yeah i, I almost yeah. let that slip for a second Sorry. so one thing that's one thing that's important for people to understand about this is that the price of blobs is a separate price from the price of ethereum gas Right up to now on Ethereum, there's been just one kind of gas and one price. Um, but um, now with blobs, there's there's regular gas, if you will, and there's this new thing called data gas. Some people call it blob gas, but data gas is the official name. Um, and um, those two prices can go up and down separately. Um, and so even if the Ethereum gas price goes up a lot, 
Um, in the old days, before EIP 4844, if the Ethereum gas price went up, then everything would get more expensive on rollups because rollups were using gas, Ethereum gas, to store their data. Now that now rollups switch to using blobs, the gas price on Ethereum can go up, but if the blob price stays low, rollup users will still be happy. That's a that's, that's a great way, I think, to to actually visualize it now. Yeah, like essentially, like I guess, I mean, maybe like call data in this case can be considered that like essentially like space or storage that both L1 and L2 share, which mm -hmm. is why L1 congest, it gets like really, really expensive for L2s. But in this case, blob gas is literally just for L2s. Yep. Interesting. I, I, I think that's a great way to think about it. I mean, anybody can use it, but it's really, um, but it's really, you know, the blob functionality is really kind of designed ideally for rollups to use. And this is part of Ethereum's uh, rollup centric roadmap. The idea that Ethereum is, um, in addition to being, you know, an ideal platform for a lot of things, it's uh, it's working to make itself an ideal platform to build rollups on. Um, and so this is a huge step down that road to provide this uh, this blob data capability that does just what rollups need and is cheaper because it um, because while it meets the needs of rollups, it it doesn't try to meet all of the needs. So to give an example of the difference that between blob data and the old call data that allows blob data to be cheaper, call data is it lives forever, whereas blob data the Ethereum consensus nodes remember it for 18 days. That's plenty long for rollups, but the fact that the network is not committing to store that data until the end of, of, of time um, actually allows it to be a lot cheaper. Cheaper for Ethereum to provide, and therefore the price can be lower. And uh, go for it, Oh, no, I was just going to say, I am going to be really interested to see what other weird things people use blob data for because i completely agree with ed that kind of rollups are the natural sort of use case although I, I i'd be shocked if there weren't some really weird interesting other things uh developers yeah. figure out to use them for we may we may see some things develop yeah other other uses for blobs that are creative and interesting and some of those will be right some of those could be quite valuable some of them could be kind of spammy and if the spammy ones come along, you know, then the price of blobs may go up a little bit until the spammers are scared off. <laughs> Inscriptions V2, is that what we're hinting at? So oh, whatever, yeah. We've, we've actually talked about this some internally. It's it's relatively awkward because one of the interesting characteristics of blobs is that when you when you buy a blob, you have to buy a full 128 kilobytes of data, and so you can't right now kind of easily sort of just get a fraction of a blob which means that use cases like inscriptions are a little trickier because you can't just have like large numbers of users swarming into post transactions. You need either sort of an application where a user kind of wants to use all of it or an application where the data gets aggregated in some way um, so that a lot of kind of different things can combine into a single blob. So inscriptions running on top of rollups? Yeah. <laughs> and where the rollups use blobs? That's a thing that can happen. Um, You're giving them too many ideas. <laughs> I I don't think that's going to come as news to the inscriptions folks. That's a good point. <laughs> um, I I think it's worth maybe just like like digging into that like um uh like that data storage kind of piece there a little bit um that, that you mentioned Ed. Uh, so like after eighteen days, essentially the stuff is parsed from like regular, it sounds like Ethereum nodes. Mm -hmm. Um, I I feel like to me like the obvious question there is like. Uh, like a, how does one access that data? Uh, and B, like how much does that has, does that actually grow the state? Like, like you know, if, if I were running a full node, like how much would that actually grow the state of Ethereum? Uh, uh, if you're running a Arbitrum or Ethereum node? Oh, uh, uh, Ethereum node. Ethereum node. Ethereum node. Yeah. So uh, this is one of the other. So I mentioned the 18 days thing that blobs are only live for 18 days. The other thing about um, the the other place where um, Ethereum makes it cheaper is that Ethereum consensus nodes that are say staking and 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 um, and participating in the consensus protocol they have to look at the blob data and and verify some cryptographic properties of it. But if you're running a normal Ethereum execution node, you don't ever need to see the blob data. Your node doesn't ever need to see it. Um, and and that's because the execution layer of Ethereum 
doesn't get to see the blob data. Ethereum will record that blob data kind of as part of its consensus, but the execution layer of Ethereum, the smart contracts running on Ethereum, they can't access the blob data directly. Um, and that makes it cheaper because most of the, because um, Ethereum nodes that aren't participating in the Ethereum consensus protocol don't need to download blobs, never need to see them. Um, that makes it cheaper. And rollups don't need Ethereum nodes to see that data uh, because the, the rollup just needs to know that the rollups nodes can get the data and they can get it from Ethereum consensus nodes. So like that's the other thing that Ethereum does to make um, blobs less functional, therefore cheaper, but less functional in ways that rollups don't mind. Um, yeah, so if you're running a normal Ethereum, just uh, a normal full node that's not staked, then your full node is probably never going to see these blobs. Yeah. Well, so so it's funny. So kind of after ever since the merge, we've been in a situation where we've had there's the kind of there's Ethereum with the uh, with kind of the execution layer, and then there's the beacon chain. But the beacon chain hasn't really kind of like, if you think about it in terms of like abstraction, the beacon chain hasn't really like leaked out at all to the execution layer in any way that kind of most people really think about or care about. And so like, if you've been running an Arbitrum 1 node, your Arbitrum 1 node points at your, your you know, if, you know your, your, you know, geth node or, or whatever execution client you're using and, and, and that's it. Um, and that's kind of a big change now post 4844 is that the consensus layer actually has become really relevant because the consensus layer is where these blobs are. And the consensus layer is if you're running a consensus node um, like Prism, um, it's, it's storing a couple weeks worth of blobs, which is you know, kind of only a couple weeks. And so it's sort of not continuous state load. It's only sort of an extra sort of an amount of hard drive space that you need, uh, which kind of makes it very, you know, very reasonable. Um, but you do to run an Arbitrum node now as of, or at least to run an Arbitrum one node as of yesterday morning, it has to have two RPC endpoints, one for execution, one for consensus, which is really interesting. Oh, interesting. I, I feel like also, I don't know. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm sure that like con a consumer hardware will still kind of normalize the whole like probably 500 gigabyte, one terabyte uh, options that people have. But I was looking the other day for like external and uh, internal hard drives for my PC. I got an eight terabyte one for like a hundred bucks. That's, incre that's incredible. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for a lot of blobs on yeah. I, I, I got a blob machine over here running now. Yeah. Well, except you won't need to store too many because you can yeah. drop them after 18 days. Thank God. If you're, Ethereum, if you're an Ethereum consensus node, yeah. Everything is scaling online, you know? Like, like we're doing the scaling on, on chain and then the our hardware companies are doing the scaling for data, which is great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I said before, right, that the, you know, Ethereum has this target of, of basically three blobs per block or one block, one blob every four seconds. Mm. The, the place that number comes from is actually looking at sort of how much bandwidth do uh, typical end users have to download blobs if they're running a consensus node, how much storage they typically have. It's really those kind of practical limits on what uh, regular people's nodes can do that, that set these, uh, that sort of set these target and max rates. Just like the Ethereum gas limit is chosen partly based on uh, sort of people thinking about, well, how much could uh, could a regular end user's machine actually do? Um, uh, same way. And so as machines grow, you expect like all these systems to get more capacity, gas limits, blob limits to go up. It's kind of like inflation of the hardware in a good way in this case. In an excellent way. Yeah. More supply like makes everyone, makes, makes our hardware a lot more capable over time. And um, so all of our systems can do more. Is it possible that um, like pricing just becomes too cheap, like you know, like like you know, to the detriment of like the uh, like an L two? No, <laughs> this is this is where congestion comes in. This Not is where it's like right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is this is this idea of kind of like, and this is sort of like, uh, I mean, kind of uh, essentially fairly based. I mean, a basic form of kind of market economics in that kind of. Ethereum and Arbitrum provide capacity and they provide a, a fixed amount of capacity actually. And within there, you have some amount of demand. When there's less demand than supply, it can be really cheap. 
Um, and in fact, um, and I don't know, maybe we're going to get into this later. I think on, on Monday night, um, a change will be executed um, that the DAO that the DAO voted on to lower the minimum base fee from 0.1 GUE to 0.01 GUE on Arbitrum 1. Um, but that's just the minimum. That's sort of like, even if there's less demand than supply, um, fees or some, some amount of fees are still collected for execution gas. But that's different than what does the price actually look like. Um, and if you look uh, just last night, I think among the kind of market turbulence, Arbitrum 1 actually ended up congested where the gas price was more than 0.1 way because there was more demand than supply. And very similarly to Ethereum, how we talked about kind of with the, if it's using more than kind of like the target amount of gas, the price goes up. Arbitrum 1 operates in a very similar way. And so these things equalize. And essentially the, the most, the, the, the set of transactions that people are willing to pay the most for will get in. Um, and other transactions won't. And if there are kind of more people willing to pay at the given at the current price than there is supply, the price will keep on rising and it'll continue rising until it levels out at some equilibrium where the amount of demand and the amount of supply are equally matched up. Yeah, so that's like, it's kind of fundamental to the design philosophy for an open and permissionless chain that if your pricing, if your pricing mechanism is designed correctly, then um, you don't have to be opinionated or judgmental about which transactions can run, which transactions have value, because the price will equalize and the people who the transactions that are willing to pay will will pay and others will not. So if somebody shows up and they want to buy all of the capacity of the of the chain, then um, as long as they're willing to outbid everyone else, then uh, so be it. Um, the chain is not going to be judgmental and say, well, you know, your uh, your your application, your use is 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 not virtuous enough, um, is not val is not valuable enough. It's um, you know the this kind of not rationing by uh, sort of administrative action of some committee somewhere, but if there is a lot of demand for the resource, rationing by price is is fundamental to the way blockchains work. And I think we're Rollups probably after this transition that's happening, you know, now and over the coming days, um, are going to be in um, a, a situation that's kind of like Ethereum, where prices are set by supply and demand, and the idea that there's a fixed price on the transaction that is going to be the same today and tomorrow, um, that's not the case. That prices will vary, and people who do transactions when the prices are lower will get a better deal. So considering the fact that, you know, uh, yeah, you know, we mentioned earlier that each L2 kind of has to uh, essentially opt into the, to the subgrade. Um, would you say that that probably each L2 also has their, I guess their own like different strategy and how to approach like blob posting, for example, because I, I have noticed, for example, some L2s have posted more blobs than others. Yeah. 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 So if you look right now at the data, just at this moment, um, you'll see that Starknet is posting a lot more, doing a lot more blob transactions than, than others. Um, they they tend to post one blob at a time when Ethereum allows you to post up to six at the same time. Um, and, you know, I don't know exactly what their strategy is there, but certainly there are different ways that chains can use this blob capability. And, uh, you know, and we're going to see uh, chains uh, strategies adapt. Um, you know, if blob prices go up, this means that there's a premium on adopting strategies that are really cost efficient. Um, you know, just like when, whenever anything is expensive, people try to figure out how to get their job done while using less of that thing. Uh, and so, I, you know, we're going to see this adaptation over time, but you definitely do see some differences in strategy across different rollups. And I think that's going to continue. I think it's so, it's so funny too, because, uh, I think the, over the past probably couple, couple of hours, 24 hours, maybe, um, I think I did see like someone from the Starknet team, like they like, almost like apologize for taking up too much blob space. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is kind of, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Like I wasn't complaining, but I guess maybe we should be. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not complaining either. Right. The, the, yeah, yeah. That's the thing, right. The, the chain will ration the resource and rat and set the price automatically. So, um, you know, there's a sense in which you can't use too much. If you're willing to pay for what you use and other people are not willing to pay for that capacity, then, you know, um, more power to you. If the price goes up, then maybe they will, uh, you know, then maybe they'll use less. And in fact, that could be built in, right? 
Um, I wouldn't be too surprised if they have a strategy that adapts to the price and behaves differently depending on the price. Use more blobs when the price is low, and you know try to economize when the price is high. That would be a, you know that would be probably a clever thing for them to do. Maybe that maybe that's their strategy. I don't know. We'll see if we'll see if and when the price um, starts to starts to move. Yeah, the the interesting thing here is basically kind of the the economics of of batch posting of of certainly for arbitrum one and i would hope for for rollups in general i think for rollups in general are, are that of kind of passing through the costs of yeah. posting to ethereum to their users and so essentially kind of right now blobs are so cheap that like your efficiency really probably doesn't matter that much um whereas kind of if if sort of there was enough demand for blobs that the amount of blobs being the price of blobs actually went up then suddenly it would start to make really meaningful difference how efficiently um, you're actually consuming blob space, um, and and so kind of uh, if you're if you're really inefficient, your users will be paying more, which probably means you'll have end up with fewer users potentially, um, and then kind of have less demand to consume blobs uh, in in that direction. O on that note, and this is a bit of like an esoteric fun fact, but I'm just reminded. It's very, very non-trivial to actually make fully efficient use of blob space because blobs are this like very mathematical thing that's like very much not like just here's my data. Um, and sort of it, it's interesting in that like we did a bunch of optimization work, although we didn't actually perfect it. We decided not to because we got within, I forget, like 98% of filling it to the degree that like the extra 2% would have to come from like some very weird and kind of risky code and encoding schemes. And, and that was kind of where, you know, that was where we decided, okay, for now we're going to top out here just because the kind of the mathematical complexity of actually being fully efficient. And Ed, you might understand why this, I don't even know yep, yep. why. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it's a funny thing. So yeah, let me give just a little bit more detail on that. Um, <laughs> The, um, because the blobs are these sort of cryptographic constructs, um, the blobs are made out of words and a word is 32 bytes of data. But it turns out that um, each word in sort of in the in blob math, if you will, each word um, is represented as a, as a big number, a big integer. Um, and there are You'd like it to be the case that any integer that you can write with 256 bits can can be in a blob. But in fact, there's like a small range of these of the po those possible integers that are not allowed for esoteric mathematical reasons. And that means you can't just take like bits of data and drop them in as blobs because it might be that when you line up the bits of your data, whatever your data is, that there might be some word which interpreted as an integer is like in the forbidden range. And then your blob would be invalid and that would lead to sadness. So you actually need to like think very carefully about arranging that each one of the little 32 uh, byte sections of your blob interpreted as an integer doesn't fall into the forbidden range. And so you need to like check that. And if it is the case, you need to move stuff around. Um, and you know, we're not here for like a, a graduate um, uh, a graduate seminar in cryptography. But bottom line is that there's a lot of tricky stuff that you need to do to use blobs effectively. And, you know, you can always squeeze out an extra like fraction of a percent by being that much more clever, meaning that your code is that much more complicated. But, you know, the from an engineering standpoint, you don't want to you, you don't want to introduce too much complexity in order to gain a tiny advantage cost. Um, you really have to think carefully about the risk versus um, risk versus reward there. Um, and so that's just one example of like the deep sort of technical and engineering work that, you know, that the engineering team had to do to uh, to make this happen. For users, it's just like, hey, we have blobs now. It's it's a lot cheaper. But there's a ton of this sort of intricate engineering that happens to make that actually possible. I just I remembered where it was that we kind of the actual detail. Yeah, so it's essentially and, and exactly like you described. And there's kind of so using up all the words is easy, and then there's sort of like a, a an odd. There ends up being kind of an, an awkward set, a, an extra set of bytes that are available. 
Um, and that we figured out to use. And you know, each word is 32 bytes, and then there's kind of some other bytes. So we figured out how to use. And then there were some extra bits available because each byte is made up of, of eight bits. And that's where we, we decided to stop and say, okay, if there's extra bits, we're, we're going to use the extra bytes because that makes a pretty, you know, pretty nice difference. The extra bits <laughs> we're not we're not using. <laughs> I, I know what, <clears throat> I kind of get that. Like, hey, this is going to be a very stupid, uh, <laughs> a very stupid analogy, maybe. But like, okay, almost when you're trying to optimize for like throwing out the trash, you want to put as much stuff in the trash as possible. But it's kind of hard to like figure out what to put kind of all, all the way at the very top because it gets smaller and smaller. As yeah, you close the exactly. Back. Yeah. And it's kind of like that. And you don't want to spend like 20 minutes like carefully packing your garbage bag. Right. You know, if, you, if it's not completely full, well, maybe you make like one extra trip to the to the trash place um, a year. Um, <laughs> so but fine. Right, right. So be it. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. Just like, you know, you want to you want to be a little bit careful about how you pack stuff in, but like, don't go crazy. <laughs> There's like a certain level of efficiency that you can reach before it gets inefficient. Well, it's it's not worth it here. I mean, because it's a computer doing it, it like, it's not you doing the work; it's a computer doing it. But still, yeah. if the software is more complicated, the risk that there's some bug that's going to bite you at the worst possible time, and even worse, maybe even lead to a security problem. Right, um, right. You know, that comes in when you add complexity. And so, you know, at some point, you just have to say enough. Ninety percent sounds good to me. That's yeah, it's way better than <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I think one thing maybe worth just like also throwing in there because I, I don't know maybe there's a difference, maybe there isn't. Um, I think up until this point, we've just been talking about L twos. Uh, what about orbit chains? Like um, whether they're L twos or L threes, and maybe even ones that are just Alt DA. Do they even see any of this stuff? Okay, so there's a whole matrix of different kind of combinations here the 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 only one that in terms of kind of normal prices um and will end up seeing a major or actually there are two sorry there are two that will with normal with kind of normal behavior that will end up seeing a large pricing reduction which are l2s on top of ethereum or sorry maybe i'm not doing it right um which are roll-up chains L, L, l2 roll-ups on top of ethereum or L3 rollups on top of Arbitrum 1. Um, L2 rollups because they'll be using blobs directly. L3 rollups, not because they're using blobs, but Arbitrum 1 is becoming significantly cheaper currently. And, and rollups on top of Arbitrum 1, because Arbitrum 1 itself is cheaper, um, will end up seeing their own prices fall significantly. Anyone using Alt DA on their primary Alt, alt data availability mechanism, they won't see any any difference although interestingly with arbitrum any trust um where um it's always been you have your data availability committee uh but if for whatever reason the data availability committee disappears or or kind of uh, enough of them disappear to not be able to use that as your data availability layer um the system can fall back to posting on ethereum um and in that case actually any trust chains could benefit um in that before the cost differential between we're on any trust data where it's super cheap and then we need to fall back would be huge. And so it's always been kind of like a, you can fall back, but it's, it's really a crisis. Like it's not, it's a kind of a major crisis. Whereas this kind of will interestingly close the gap a little bit in that it won't be at quite as big of a deal if your, your committee can't actually sort of form and reach consensus because the fallback option is, is a lot cheaper than it had been before, at least for now. Um, Interesting. That's a great point, actually. So yeah, it's it's like it's like, like as you mentioned in the worst case, um, like the transaction difference for users, I guess currently wouldn't be that different. In the worst yeah, case. right now with blobs as cheap as they are, and it's interesting because I, I I mean I think the expectation <laughs> is that it's fairly it's fairly temporary, but for now the prices on Arbitrum One and the prices on Arbitrum Nova are going to be very similar. Now, with Arbitrum Nova, you have you're not dependent on Ethereum, and so as blobs become congested, they'll become quite different again. But yeah. for now, the prices are going to look very similar. Um, yeah, um, right. Because that's really that's really the advantage of Nova is that the price the price is going to stay where yeah. it is. Whereas with yeah, on Arbitrum One, if blobs get more expensive, then the, then things will get more expensive on on the chain. 
Exactly. So if you're like looking at long-term planning and you're saying, hey, I want to build a game and I want it to be a certain level of cheap and I want to kind of not be worried about, hey, blobs are going to get filled up. You still want alt, you know, any trust or some form of alt DA presumably. But if you're, you know, if you're a user and you're looking at the prices today and you're not really thinking about the future, it's going to look quite similar, which is, you know, kind of crazy. And I never thought we'd see the day. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, I, I think, well, the, I mean, and the cooler part, of course, is that yesterday technically was only like kind of part one of two uh, with cost reductions on Arbitrum 1. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. right. So yesterday, we, um, you know, there was the Arbitrum Atlas upgrade on Arbitrum 1. Uh, starts using blobs. You see a big cost reduction on um, on this coming well, early Tuesday morning, early early morning hours of Tuesday morning here in the U.S. East, um, there is another set of uh, fee cuts that were approved by the Dow that are going to that are going to kick in, and so that's going to be just a reduction in other parts of the cost. It's going to reduce the um, the cost of data posting even more because there was a kind of um, uh, there was a kind of surplus charge on data posting that uh, that has existed that will will be eliminated uh, per the Dow's decision and then also the minimum uh, gas price for execution on L2 the Dow has cut from um, 0.1 GUI to 2.01 GUI so to a tenth of what it uh, what it has been uh, and so those changes both uh, will take effect on early Tuesday morning U.S. East time and so we're, and so we expect to see a lot of transactions to get a lot cheaper uh, when that happens, even even cheaper than they already are. The whole thing was really it was really interesting in that kind of the the Dow the Dow had a, a vote on this. Um, I think that started yeah started ten days ago um, in order to kind of actually vote to to execute this change because. And, and it is purely kind of a change in sort of the the economics of the system as, as controlled by the Dow. And, and they're kind of the vote ended up being ninety nine point eight five percent cutting these prices, uh, which is really interesting in that kind of it's it's a vote to to kind of in the short term reduce the amount of profit that that, that revenue that the Dow is taking in into its treasury um, in the interest of adoption, in the interest of picking up kind of way more users and being way more competitive and having Arbitrum 1 be the, the best place to be if you're a developer or a user, um, even kind of at, at the very short term effect of sort of reducing the amount of fees collected into the treasury, um, I think based based out of sort of a, a, a sort of long term vision of this should be the place everybody wants to be and everybody ends up um, and kind of the the sort of the benefits will come in the long term of sort of doing this on the, on the short term and, and seeing 99.85 percent um all kind of share basically you know almost every single voter share that share that sentiment was was kind of really interesting and yeah. cool and so the result is a big win for users and developers who are who are going to be who are on arbitrum one or who are going to be on arbitrum one right big reduction in 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 the cost of users using the chain um and really a transition to a, a more mature kind of economics for for the chain. Yeah. So it's exciting to see it. And um, uh, and it's great that when the Dow made the decision, it made it like with such strong um, consensus. Yeah, it's it's going to be really interesting to see how fees play out, just in that, as we were talking about earlier, kind of you have, well, how does how does capacity get a lot? And what if there's more demand than than supply? There's congestion. And so the, the really interesting thing to see evolve over time will be kind of these artificial price, these essentially sort of semi-artificial sort of revenue sources are, are being reduced now, where it's kind of no matter how much demand there is to use the system, everybody's going to get charged for this. And the, and the major, major, major factor that remains is this, like, if there's more demand than supply, people are going to be bidding for space and and pay more and that gets collected. And so there's kind of this really interesting, I don't think anybody can predict question of like what does this look like over the next six months in that there's there's plenty of scenarios where demand picks up um and and there's kind of you know essentially kind of 
permanent congestion in that sort of there's no floor and there's always enough demand to fill the supply, which is exactly what Ethereum has been like for years and where the where the price is kind of market set based on people have put a certain value into their use cases on the chain that they're willing to pay for. And there are enough people willing to pay that value in order to actually fill up the whole capacity. And you have this kind of, I would say, healthier, more organic system where you can't really predict what that's going to look like other than sort of to make guesses about what adoption will look like and how much people will value actually using Arbitrum on block space. But it'll be really cool to see it evolve. 100%. Yeah, no, I mean, <clears throat> and, and I think that's what I was trying to like, conveyed to like um, a lot of the people that I was speaking to, like even yesterday when all this crazy stuff was happening, like, you know, like kind of the whole thing about, about all this stuff being cheaper fees, it's like not necessarily cheaper fees, just like vastly trying to increase capacity for when we, you know, like get to that moment that you're talking about, Harry, where like uh, even all twos are maybe just as uh, like, you know, full of demand as Ethereum is, right? Yeah. So then you could, L2s can still be cheaper because they have more capacity have more capacity right. already and of course you know we're continuing to push the envelope to to uh, to grow scalability and every time you add capacity price drops more users can do more stuff at lower cost um and that's really a big part of the story yeah well and, and i'll note by the way it's arbitrum ones had had kind of more uh, been kind of right along or or sometimes passing demand for for kind of compared to ethereum or at least you know usage compared to ethereum for a while now the the big arbitrum one though has around i guess at what is it now like six or seven times the amount of capacity as ethereum has yeah about um, yeah and so it's kind of it's not that prices go up when the demand reaches kind of the similar level as ethereum it, it has some headroom pass there although i think kind of the expectation is that probably even with that headroom you you know there's there's so much value people get out of out of using it that it you know could end up in a in a you know in a place where kind of you're you're above the floor price right but then you have improvements coming along like stylus like which will make um computation which will allow applications to do a lot more computation for the same gas and so that also increases the capacity of how much amazing stuff can be done on arbitrum one or other arbitrum stack chains um, without, uh, w within the same gas limit. So, you know, scalability is just all about letting people do more, um, on the same chain and that makes things better for everybody. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that's a nice, it's a nice pivot into the like, okay, but what next? And sort of like, yeah, like we're talking about like, Hey, this stuff could end up sort of congested, but we don't, nobody really wants that. And so figuring out ways to actually increase the supply is sort of a, is a big deal and, and kind of in there, I mean, Ed just was saying Arbitrum Stylus, yeah, which should sort of, in terms of using this execution capacity, it just makes more, it doesn't increase the capacity technically, it makes way more efficient use of the capacity. So kind of for every sort of, you know, smart contract call that you could make to kind of execute a certain operation, you could just, that call takes up less resources because the code to run it is actually running on a, on a more efficient um, web assembly virtual machine. So you have that. Um, you have kind of orbit chains right now in their kind of current standard configuration where um, kind of roll up technology provides you kind of a, a method of scaling. That method of scaling can be replicated horizontally. And so you can have Arbitrum 1 and Arbitrum 2, and both of those have their own independent capacity, um, which is kind of another great technique. And I think applications that are looking to kind of really sort of have kind of dedicated encapsulated user bases and, and kind of pick up a large amount of usage themselves are looking kind of in that direction very much. And then, and maybe Ed can say a few words onto that, onto this, you have kind of some interesting ideas around kind of a, a concept that we're talking, we call chain clusters yeah. that actually give you kind of a hybrid ground where you have sort of separate chain space um, like orbit chains give you, but they're configured in a way where you can actually interoperate between them much more effectively. Right. That's right. So, you know, there's, I think the, the big takeaway here is that there's a lot of stuff that is, um, that is, that is going to be coming available in the future to, uh, to provide a lot more throughput, a lot more capability, faster interoperation between chains, greater, um, greater composability. Um, and really that capacity is going to be increasing in, in every dimension on the same chain across chains in terms of the number of chains. Um, we see kind, we see growth along all these lines and that's important because there is so much unmet demand for uh, functionalities on 
um, on blockchains. Um, so many things that people would like to do that are still uh, limited by gas limits or by or by costs. And you know, we're going to continue to push. We in the community will continue to push this forward. And we're going to see there's really so much, um, uh, so many, uh, so much unmet demand now that expanding capacity in every dimension is, uh, uh, I think, is going to just allow more and more interesting stuff to happen. Hundred percent. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I, I, like multi-dimensional capacity. That should be like the next tagline that we have. <laughs> Growing in every dimension. <laughs> the blobs are getting bobbier. They're, getting... <laughs> they're, they're 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 being gaseous. They're becoming gaseous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, wait. I wait the meme. I wait the memes here. They're. We, we need more good blob memes. We definitely do. I mean, I, I'm sure they'll come. I, you know, as, uh, as, as, as the blob space gets more efficient, maybe, possibly. Uh, yeah. But I, I think maybe yesterday was peak blob memes, to be honest. Uh, anyways, <laughs> uh, th I think that was great. Uh, I think like, that, that was a great overview of, like, Denkin, Atlas, et cetera. Um, really looking forward to seeing all these updates that we're talking about, like start to like, you know, like, you know, whether it's like test net, main net, et cetera, kind of like hit the market and people kind of give their feedback on it. Um, but yeah, that was awesome. Um, I think, I think we can probably end it off there then. Like, you know, I, I, anywhere alpha, I think I'd be a little too uncomfortable with, to be honest. I think we'll, we'll stop at chain clusters. <laughs> that's just, I, I think that's enough. Okay. <laughs> oh man, I like it. I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's not, uh, yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's not, it's not every day that that an upgrade that kind of required this much coordination and, and this much effort. And I don't, I don't just mean like the Arbitrum changes. I mean the the Ethereum changes too. And you know, like at uh, at at off chain having you know having kind of the 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 Prism team as kind of a, a major part of the company. We've we've you know really gotten to kind of be. Uh, be really in the weeds from uh, from the from the start on on kind of all things uh, all things for it for four and and uh, and kind of be able to sort of really kind of be driving on that sort of like both you know the Ethereum side the Arbitrum side you know engineering side like it yeah. you know really been kind of like this crazy comprehensive effort and you know yeah it's, it's just amazing to see yeah. <laughs> So I kind of had th had this moment as these upgrades were happening and everyone was sort of, you know, on video calls and watching all of the different metrics and monitors. This was kind of like a spacecraft landing. And um, it's, you know, you kind of have the vibe of that in terms of the people in the room talking about stuff and, um, you know, seriously focused on their monitors and like with ridiculous numbers of different graphs and like numbers updating on their screen. And then sort of chattering to each other in this hyper technical talk um but also it's a celebration so like this really was like we landed two spacecraft on the moon and neither of them tipped over so um <laughs> you know that's kind of what it feels like to me it's 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 an amazing moment that is really a culmination of a huge amount of really dedicated work by people not only in off-chain labs and the prism team and the nitro team but also across the whole Ethereum community and the whole Arbitrum community. 100. percent Yeah, I mean, I think that was a great that was a great way to end off. We're about we're about to hit that hit the hour mark. That, that, that was amazing. Ed. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do any better than that. Um, but thank you guys for coming on. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, I'm look, looking forward to doing one of these again uh, for the next Moon spacecraft landing we do. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I think that'll be stylus most likely, but. Nonetheless, thanks for coming on, guys. I hope everyone appreciated that overview of Denkin and Atlas. And yeah, we'll catch you guys on uh, CT. Thanks. Good. Good seeing everybody. See y'all. Have a good one, guys. Bye.